Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Everyone is touched by psychiatric conditions, either themselves or a loved one. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Today on Healthy Minds. I've spent most of my life studying learning and memory. Nothing could be more fundamentally humanistic than how we acquire new information about the world and how we store it as memory. To paraphrase you in the book in terms of one of the key findings about how the brain changes, anybody watching us right now who remembers what we're saying, their brain has changed. Absolutely. Your brain has changed anatomically as a result of this conversation. I tell my friends, I try to urge you to forget it because you don't want to have those anatomical changes remain. But if you remember it, your brain is different than when we sorted out. A few minutes together. And one of the wonderful things about art is it changes your brain. I can't speak of future directions at all because it moves in so many directions. I can tell you future directions in <clears throat> biological analysis of art. Now what I've done are primitive little steps, really sort of cognitive psychological insights and how this occurs uh, based on really ideas of Ernst Chris and Ernst Gambridge, elaborate a little bit further. But we're now reaching the point where we really can begin to get a more empirical understanding of what happens when somebody looks at a work of art, particularly when they look at uh, figurative versus abstract art. That's today on Healthy Minds. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. Welcome to Healthy Minds. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Every time I speak with Nobel laureate Dr. Eric Kandel, I learn something new. Today I speak with Dr. Kandel about the brain and art, as well as the science of memory. How does art, as well as other experiences, change your brain? Most of us are not artists, but each of us can have a creative experience when we view art, and how we view it can help us better understand our brains. Dr. Kandel's research has had a tremendous impact on brain science. Eric, thank you for joining us today. Jeff, I'm pleased to be here. I want to talk to you about your latest book, which puts together two of your passions, brain science and art. What was it like for you to write that book? Um, I had a great deal of fun writing that book uh, because he was a major artistic movement, the New York Abstract Expressionists, uh, that went from people like de Kooning and Pollock to Rothko. Uh, and each of them moved from being figurative to being abstract. And I'm very fascinated by the transition from figuration to abstraction. And these artists gave me a great opportunity to explore that. And you put it in a context of how art can change based on an approach and how science can change and progress based on an approach. And I want you to talk about the um, define reductionism and talk about how that, uh, how you really look at that right. in both the art right. and the right. science. Right. Um, my initial um, idea for this came from an argument that C.P. Snow made that the arts and the sciences are world apart. Uh, and they have different um, methodologies, different goals. They don't communicate with one another. And the intellectual world would benefit if the bridges between those two parts of life uh, were built. He said that some time ago, but it struck me that he really got things wrong. First of all, he assumes that uh, the sciences are antithetical to the humanities. 
I have spent most of my life studying learning and memory. Nothing could be more fundamentally humanistic than how we acquire new information about the world and how we store it as memory. We are who we are because of what we learn and we remember. Uh, and that identifies us. Um, so number one, uh, science can be humanistic. But also, and this is not adequately appreciated, many artists are experimental. You see this most dramatically, for example, with someone like Jackson Pollock painting in a conventional way with a canvas on the wall, and then he decides, this is not what I want to do, throws the canvas onto the floor, walks around it and splatters paint on it, a revolution in how art is created. And many examples. Rothko starts off as a figurative artist, then begins to have bars of color, ultimately has bars of black color. Fantastic. To think that you would put bars of color on a canvas and elicit such powerful, almost religious experience uh, from the beholder. I once sat in front of one of Rothko's paintings, and I said to myself, you think you're a reductionist? You're nothing compared to this guy. Uh, the spiritual power that he releases in one, because each one of those bars of color is really several layers. So you see sort of fluorescence coming out from within each of those bars. And it's very, very moving. Um, and there is a Rothko Chapel in Houston, which I visited again for the second time a few months ago. And it's marvelous. You walk in, they're all dark Rothkos. You stand in front of them, one of them, and you see nothing. And after a while, you see movement in the canvas. And you don't know, are you hallucinating or something really going up? It's a fantastic. The ability to listen in you uh, imaginative and imaginary responses is quite extraordinary with Rothko. In the book and in your other writings, you speak about the mind and the brain. The mind is a series of functions carried out by the brain. Everything that we do, from hitting a backhand in tennis to the most creative works of art, are all mediated by the brain. All these mental activities, even you know, works of art. Everything. Everything. Unlike what looking at art that has a figure that almost looks like a picture, or a landscape that almost looks That's like right. a, a snapshot That's or right. a picture, the abstract art can elicit all sorts of emotions. There is a convention that sort of began with uh, Gombridge of distinguishing between bottom-up and top-down processing and how a viewer responds to art. We all built with a visual machinery that has evolved through you know, hundreds of thousands of years, uh, the human visual system. And that guides much of our vision. But in addition, each of us has individual experiences, uh, and that modulates how this basic machinery works. Uh, with abstract art, you use much more of this top-down processing uh, because there's so much ambiguity in the art. And top-down processing, which brings out our own creative potential, uh, I find extremely enjoyable. I may have the most modest, shallow idea, but I love it. It's mine. I created it from de novo. And to some degree, one feels that with a work of art. And I think this is why, at its best, abstract art is so powerful in eliciting your inner feelings, your inner thoughts, your inner ideas. You, you speak about how the beholder is active in terms of he was actively involved, yes, yes. This first came from Ernst Chris, who was a big influence in my life. He was a very famous psychoanalyst, but initially started off as an art historian. At the end of his life, when I knew him, he wrote Psychoanalytic Explorations of Art. He brought the two together. And he pointed out, if you and I look at the same painting, we see it somewhat differently. What does that mean? That means that the beholder is undergoing a creative experience that in a very, very modest way recapitulates the creative experience of the artist. Now, it's incomparably um, more modest. But nonetheless, it points out that looking at a work of art is, for the beholder, a creative process. And Gombrich picked up on this. And you know, the whole sort of modern critical thinking about art evolved from 
Chris and guy before him, Regal, who said, art history is going to die unless it becomes scientific. The science it ought to relate itself to is psychology. And the problem it ought to address is the beholder share, how the viewer responds to a work of art. This is the most obvious thing in the world. Painting is not complete until the painter paints it and the beholder responds to it. But no one had really spelled it out very clearly. Alois Regal did in first Chris and then Gombrich really addressed these issues and now everyone is talking about it. And, and in many ways it goes to how we as people behold all aspects of the world, not just art. We recreate it all, but art gives us a chance to see it because we all see it in principle the same way. We all see it differently, but it's there for us to see it in the same way. When did you first develop the interest in art and in art how it relates to brain science? Uh, my interest in art goes back to my sophomore year at Harvard when I took a wonderful fine arts course and I really enjoyed very much what I learned there about the history of art. And um, there was a great museum at Harvard, the Fogg Museum. I started to visit it regularly and I just enjoyed looking at art. Um, and then um, when uh, Denise and I married in 1956, um, she painted me on our honeymoon. It's hanging in our bedroom. It's actually a mall. She's only, she's only done two paintings in her whole life, a landscape which we've lost, but the picture of me, which is wonderful, uh, still hangs there. And then we began to buy other artists besides Denise Kandel, and we have a wonderful collection. If you walk into our apartment, it's like being in an art gallery. Uh, we have Beckmans, we have Klimt's, we have Kokoschkas, we have Schielers, we have Nolders, we have Munks, really wonderful stuff. Uh, and we have an Israeli artist called Moshe Kupferman, probably Israeli's most important artist. So we have a very nice collection. I mean, we're academics, so this is, you know, 50 cents art, but I'm joking with you, but, but, um, but we enjoyed it. And we've been doing this since the beginning of our marriage. Have you ever painted? No, I have no competence in that at all. So you're the beholder? I'm completely the beholder and beholden, yes. I want you to talk a little bit, because in the book you talk about the science of memory and the work that you've done to help us understand memory and learning better. I'd like you to speak a little bit about that as well. Um, well, when I entered the field, one had learned that certain structures in the brain were very important for memory storage, and specifically that the hippocampus was important for explicit memory storage but one had no idea how memory actually occurred at the cellular level. Um, I had I wanted to be a psychoanalyst, I went to medical school to become a psychoanalyst, influenced by Ernst Chris. Uh, but in my senior year, I thought even a psychoanalyst should know something about the brain. And I took an elective in brain science. There's only one place in New York that had a laboratory in brain science. That was here at Columbia, Harry Grunfest. Um, and I had a fantastic experience. I never had anything like this before. And because of that, Harry Grunfist nominated me for the NIH. And instead of going into the draft, I went to the NIH, and I became a scientist. And Wade Marshall, my boss, allowed me to do whatever I wanted. Brenda Milner had first shown that the hippocampus is critical for complex memory storage. No one had ever recorded from cells in the hippocampus. And one thing I learned in Grunfist's lab was how to put electrodes into single cells. It was a skill most people didn't have. So I learned how to dissect off the cerebral cortex, expose the hippocampus, and together with Alden Spencer, another draft dodger, whom I recruited to join me, the two of us were the first people ever to record from the hippocampus. Our seniors went wild. They said a typical NIH experience. Two young guys, incompetent but surrounded by this wonderful intellectual environment. It lifts them up and they do something interesting. And we were excited. First people ever to record from neurons in the hippocampus. We studied them very thoroughly. After some time, we turned to each other and said, what did we learn about memory storage? Not a damn thing. You know, to study memory, you have to see how information comes in, how it's modified by the learning experience, how it goes out. Nobody knew what was the information coming into the hippocampus. We, need, we realized we needed a simpler system. Alden was a mammalian chauvinist. He would never leave the mammalian nervous system. I didn't know enough, and I thought I would use the simplest system available, marine snail aplasia, uh, gigantic nerve cells, 
uh, and very few of them. So I worked out a very simple behavior, defined the neural circuit. It was a guilt withdrawal reflex, like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. And I shocked the animal in the tail. And this reflex dramatically enhanced. And if I sh came back with a weak shock later, it continued to show this dramatic enhancement. And after just one painful shock, it showed this dramatic enhancement for half an hour. But if you did five or 10 of these painful shocks, showed it for days. It learned it. It l remembered it for days. So I went in. I found that in short-term memory, there's a functional strengthening of synaptic connections. But long-term memory, there's a more powerful strengthening and is an anatomical change. And that's due to the fact there's alterations in gene expression. That was the first demonstration that anyone ever had of what learning and memory involves, a change in how nerve cells communicate with one another. Kahale predicted it. Lots of people said the opposite. You know, lots of ideas floating around. I was the first one, very lucky, to demonstrate rigorously how learning occurs in a very simple system. It turns out to be a very general mechanism. And of course, you know, the era of molecular biology was coming along. I was able to show how you know, the nucleus is signaled, how it turns on gene expression, et cetera, et cetera. So I was able to, to use that very effectively. And then, uh, in part with support from the Libras, I was able to shift and open up a second front in the 1980s and work on the mouse in addition to work on a plesia possible to do genetically modified mice. And we were able to verify the same thing and then begin to study animal models of mental disorders. We had a very nice, with Eleanor Simpson, very nice model of schizophrenia. To paraphrase you in the book in terms of one of the key findings about how the brain changes, anybody watching us right now who remembers what we're saying, their brain has changed. Absolutely. Your brain has changed anatomically as a result of this conversation. I tell my friends, I try to urge you to forget it because you don't want to have those anatomical changes remain. But if you remember <laughs> it, your brain is different than when we started out. <laughs> a few minutes together. And one of the wonderful things about art is it changes your brain. You remember it, produces anatomical changes, and you have the pleasure of looking at this and really makes a big impact on you. What do you see as future directions in art, given what you know? I can't speak of future directions in art because it moves in so many directions. I can tell you future directions in <clears throat> biological analysis of art. Uh, now, what I've done are primitive little steps, really sort of cognitive psychological insights in how this occurs, uh, based on really ideas of Ernst Chris and Ernst Gambridge elaborate a little bit further. But we're now reaching the point where we really can begin to get a more empirical understanding of what happens when somebody looks at a work of art, particularly when they look at uh, figurative versus abstract art. Um, there's something called construal theory uh, that has argued and documented in many ways that um, we distinguish between, importantly, in many logical processes, but whether something is close to us or far away, both in space or in time. So if I ask you, uh, you know, I'm putting up a hotel across the street, and I want to uh, label the ladies' room and the gentlemen's room, how do I do it? Um, you would say, you put up a cartoon. If I would tell you, I'm putting up a hotel 20 blocks away, you would say, I would write gentlemen and ladies. If I were to ask you, I'm putting up a hotel now, what would you do? Cartoon. I'm putting up a hotel in the same place a year from now, what would you say? Write it out. So we make a big distinction in both space and time of how we think about these things. And this is also true. We've now shown, together with a collaboration with Celia Durkin, a shared graduate student, Daphne Shahani, with figurative versus abstract art. We treat abstract art as if it's further away, either in space or in time. And the same tests that distinguish between this uh, and logical distinctions also applies to this uh, almost identically. 
And you describe how, because of the reductionism that occurs in abstract art, it's really yes. broken down, yes. it almost challenges the brain to look at things much more, in a different way. Much more. It really invokes your creative processes much more than figurative art. Um, and it's interesting. Um, this is true for art. It's not true for music. So when you know, painting became abstract, you know, many people enjoyed it from the very beginning. But when Schoenberg began to really move into that realm, it's not enjoyable. It's just too dissonant, too complicated. So it shows you it's not a universal principle. In the book and in your other writings, you speak about the mind and the brain. And I'd like you to explain for our audience. The mind is a series of functions carried out by the brain. Everything that we do, from hitting a backhand in tennis to the most creative works of art, are all mediated by the brain. All these mental activities, this set of functions carried out by the brain. Even, you know, works of art. Everything. 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 In the book, you write about how we are social animals. Yes. And what that means and that, how that relates to us recognizing faces, recognizing emotions and faces. And I'd like you to speak a little bit about that. Um, well, faces are extremely important in our lives. We recognize others, we recognize ourselves uh, by our faces. Uh, and, you know, in forming a collaboration, forming a partnership and falling in love, facial expression of the person that you're interacting with is extremely important. Um, and that's because um, faces are treated differently by the brain than any other object. Uh, for example, if I uh, take a pen and I turn it upside down, you have no difficulty recognizing it as a pen. But if I take a face and turn it upside down, you have a difficult time recognizing the person. And even if it's a, a well, known face, one that you know very well. If you change the expression of the face on one image and not on the other, you turn it upside down, you can't tell the difference between the two images, even though one is distorted and the other one not. So there's a special process. And when people began to explore the brain representation of faces, Doris Chow and Winfred Frywall did this. It was amazing. There are in the brain face patches, six of them. I, if they combined brain imaging with single cell recording. So they showed a face and they saw these six areas light up. Then they put electrodes there and they saw in those six patches, cells only responded to faces. Some responded to the face straight on, one to side views of this face, uh, one to distortions of the face. And one of the reasons faces are so well represented in our visual life is because they're so well represented in the brain. And you speak about how in abstract drawings or paintings of the face, it really challenges our brains. Yes, yes, yes. One of the things, for example, when you look at de Kooning, when de Kooning moves and becomes abstract, in many, many of those images, you can still see, at least the imagination can recreate figurative structures, including faces. So it's easy to come back to thinking you're looking at a face even though you're looking at a quite abstracted feature of it. Eric, I want to thank you so much for all that you've done in our field. I've which done has it had an impact. purely for selfish reasons because I enjoy it. Well, you enjoy it, and it's also had an extraordinary impact. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. And we're fortunate to, to have you, and I've been very fortunate and appreciate the opportunity to once again sit down and have this conversation with you. Jeff, thank you for interviewing me. Thank you. To be continued. Every time I speak with Nobel laureate Dr. Eric Kandel, I learn something new. Most of us are not artists, but each of us can have a creative experience when we view art. And how we view it can help us better understand our brains. Dr. Kandel's research has had a tremendous impact on brain science. And our increasing knowledge about the brain is why I always emphasize that when it comes to mental health, with help, there is hope. 
Until next time, I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Goodbye. Do not suffer in silence. With help, there is hope. Healthy Minds is brought to you in part by the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation, and the New York State Office of Mental Health. If you would like to watch our expert interview in its entirety, log on to bbrfoundation.org slash healthyminds.